Hi, this is Nisha, and today I just kind of felt like revisiting one of my, frankly, favorite submachine guns, or in this case, semi-auto carbines from the 80s. This is a gun you've seen in multiple videos. This is my British Sterling Mark VI. 9mm carbine made in Dagenham, England by the original Sterling Arms, which is no longer in business. This is frankly a very rare carbine, but you really don't hear much about it. You mostly hear about Uzis and HK94s from the 80s, and those are cool, but those came in in much larger numbers. Now we have complete videos on the history of British SMGs, so I'm not really going to go into that now. I will just kind of briefly go over some thoughts and things, more informal. So I brought out my British Sten. This is a Mark III kit in semi-auto. And uh, the Mark III itself you don't hear much about. You're probably used to a British uh, Sten from World War II being the, uh, the Mark II. That tends to be the most popular. That's the one with the shorter shroud, uh, removable barrel. Uh, often you see them with either this stock or what's called the loop stock or skeleton stock. This is the so-called T. Now the, uh, the Mark III is interesting because it first appeared in April, May of 1942, and this was the cheapest version of the Sten ever made. This thing is pretty much all stamped steel, including the receiver, which is rolled stamped steel. About the only machined parts are the bolt and the trunnion, and of course the barrel itself. These things, they could turn out in just a couple of hours. They would make about 900,000 of the Mark III, with the majority coming from uh, Lines Brothers Limited. Now, not to go too deep into the Sten history, although it's very fascinating to me, these were also chambered for 9mm. They were select fire. They didn't have a folding stock, but this is a quick detaching stock. You just press in and slide this off. They had a 7.8 inch barrel. This version, as like most, has fixed sides, although there were some versions with uh, somewhat adjustable sides. This was a cheap, very easy to make, very simple to make gun that Britain kind of threw together at the last minute when they realized they couldn't get enough Thompsons and that Sterling could not produce enough Lanchesters for the war. So, yeah, the Sten gun. It, it did its job, but it had a lot of shortcomings. And this is what directly led to the Sterling. Well, after the war was very much in favor of the Allies, Britain said, you know, we need a better submachine gun. So they outlined what they'd like to see. Obviously, select fire. It needed to have a barrel about eight inches. It needed to be about six pounds still firing 9mm, they wanted a folding stock, yada yada yada. This led to the, the, to the Patchet Mark I, which went into uh, development and prototype production in 1944, and a few were given to British paratroopers for field testing in 1945. Some people say they were used in Operation Market Garden, other people refute this, it doesn't matter. It was a late World War II gun, and that was kind of the problem. The Patchet never really went into serial production, but because by the time they were ready to go with it, the war was over, uh, the war budget was being slashed, and uh, they had tons of guns already on hand. So the Patchet was shelled for a number of years. It came back up as the Sterling, which was the company Patchet worked for. It was adopted in, finally in 1951 when they decided, hey, we really need to replace all these old Sten guns. There had been some accidents, yada yada. They were wearing out because they were never built to last a long time. Well, you would have the L4A1, and excuse me, I messed that up. Oh, well, 
this isn't going to be an edited video so there you go guys <laughs> you would have the uh the l2 a1 l2 a2 and then l2 a3 which was the finalized version of the sterling and british service these would really start to see issuance after the korean war possibly late korean war and be very popular in britain for decades after this was their submachine gun and you can really tell they learned lessons from the Sten we still have a 7.8 inch barrel we weigh just a smidge over six pounds we have a folding stock which to be fair is not the quickest to deploy but it is a very comfortable folding stock the ergonomics were vastly improved over the Sten with a pistol grip a much more ergonomic selector here versus the cross pin on the uh, Sten here. The Sterling had much better sights. The rear is adjustable with the two position flip aperture and the front in theory is adjustable but often is kind of stuck in place because of the finish. The charging handle was upswept and hooked for an easier thing. The barrel shroud on a military gun would pretty much go all the way out with just the tip of the barrel sticking out. We have a protector here in front of the ejection port so your hand doesn't slide too far forward or back. It's a very nice submachine gun and it's also very reliable, whereas the Sten can suffer they really addressed it with the sterling. They put these helical cuts in the bolt, which worked as sand cuts, pushing debris out of the way. But truly where the sterling re achieved its reliability was with its magazines. Let's take a look. I'm trying to get one out here, guys. It's a military pouch, Aussie actually for the F1. Let me get a Sten mag out too. Okay, so here's our original Sten Mag. 32 rounds, double stack, single feed. This is basically copied from the German MP28 because of the whole Lanchester connection. It worked okay, but it's really not a great mag. Single feed mags don't work well when they're double stack. They didn't easily, it's straight, it sticks out very far. They're difficult to load past a certain point. You need a tool. And it has just a standard follower. In fact, these were so problematic that some mags were restricted to 20 rounds by making them a single stack by putting pins in. And no, that's not one of them. I've got some of them. So when they went to do the Sterling mag, and, and Patchett did design this, they really went all out. This is probably the finest submachine gun mag ever made. We have a curb body, which improves feeding. We have double stack and double feed. And we have these two rollers as part of the follower that just really pushes it over the top. And if that's not enough, the spring in here is actually cylindrical so it can't get stuck to the sides. And to top it all off, this holds 34 rounds, so we have a couple of extra cartridges too. And since it's curved, it really doesn't stick out. Now, since Britain had a ton of uh, Sten mags still around, they did make the Sterling backwards compatible, which is pretty neat. So it could feed from standard Sten mags, but of course they really wanted to uh, use it with its mags here. Plus they look cooler. So briefly, these were made in the UK by Sterling for both the military and for export. They were also made by the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield just for the British military. It's worth noting that Sterling would do this kind of crinkle finish 
whereas the infield factory would just do a straight parkerized finish. They would also be copied in Canada by Canadian Arms Limited, Arsenals Limited, uh, CAL as the C1. They would simplify the design, especially the magazine for mass production, and these Canadian versions would work very well. And they would be basically copied without permission in India as the 1A1 and the later 2A1. Now, Australia would have a version similar, or I should say a submachine gun kind of based on this, but it's not really a, a sterling derivative, so we'll leave it for there. Now, whereas the military called this the 2, excuse me, L2A3, Sterling themselves called it the Mark IV. So let's get into where semi-autos appear. The first purpose-built semi-auto Sterling was the Sterling Mark IV police carbine, and these started to go into production in the 70s. It was the same as the submachine gun, except it had either a modified full-auto trigger pack or a semi-auto only trigger pack. It still fired from an open bolt, though, and as far as I know, it always had the 7.8, the 8-inch barrel. I don't think they had a 16-inch version at the time. If they did, they weren't very common, and they were just sent to America. Some also made it up to Canada. But because of changing legislations, by the late 70s, this gun would go into development and then production at Sterling, the Mark VI. This is a closed bolt gun, as you've seen, semi-auto only trigger pack, and it would be offered either with an 8 or a 16 inch barrel for legal reasons. They would put a blocking bar inside so a full auto bolt would not fit. They would also modify the front trunnion so a submachine gun barrel could not easily be put in. And they would have a pin in the lower so a full auto trigger pack couldn't be installed. And there would be a few versions. Earlier on, some like this one would have a bayonet lug, although it's really not usable. Later, you would see some with turret mounting points on the top for an optic. This doesn't have it, though. And some would even have a turned down caulking handle, presumably to work with an optic so you wouldn't bang it up against, although they look very ugly. These would usually ship with a standard, or maybe two, 34 round mags, but a short 10 round mag was also made available. And yeah, these would be brought into the U.S. by three separate importers. From the very, probably the very early 80s, perhaps the very late 70s, until Sterling went out of business in 1986. There was another version known as the Sterling Mark 7, which was only brought in as a pistol. The Mark 7 would either have a 4-inch or sometimes an 8-inch barrel, although I think all the ones in the U.S. were 4. And it was based on the so-called paratrooper version of this gun, which was essentially the same gun, but it had a, either no stock or a removable stock. We're talking military here. And then the front end would be truncated quite a bit. You can pull up pictures of Mark 7s. I have had an original in the past, but sold it on because it's not exactly a military issue and uh, these guns are all getting rare. To speak of that, during the relatively brief import period of less than a decade, only about 1,600 Mark 6 carbines and Mark 7 pistols were brought into the USA. Now, Sterling only made total about 6,000 semi-auto Sterlings of any type, and I think that even includes the Mark IV police carbine, although data is a little hard to get with the company having gone out of business well before the internet age. These guns would typically come, as I said, with one to two mags, a sling, sometimes a cleaning kit, and also sometimes a display, a dummy barrel. Anyone who has an Uzi knows what I mean. They just, they're just fake. And they're really cool guns, and they did not get a lot of attention in the U.S. until 2009 when Century Arms started selling the Wise Light kit builds. 
known as the uh, Mark IV Sporter. And today, finally, even though for a long time these guns didn't get a lot of recognition or interest on the market, they are starting to get appreciated. They are very well designed as semi-autos. They do fire from a closed bolt, but they do have an out-of-battery safety. The trigger is very nice. It's not your typical heavy trigger. They are striker fired. They have nested springs. They have the same reliability, or at least very close to it, as the real deal. And they were just excellent guns. They're just a lot of fun to shoot. No recoil, very pleasant impulse, very reliable. Eats any kind of 9mm I've ever tried to feed it good ergonomics and again the buttstock while it's not the easiest to fold and unfold once it's deployed is very comfortable and when it's folded up it does lead to a very compact package so the idea wasn't quick but it was maximum comfort and compactness so i just wanted to really share this gun with you it's something we've showed in the past like i said but it's just really worth checking out if you'd like to know more on the history or the ultimate fate of the militaries l2 a3 check out our historical videos they'll be on the playlist as always we appreciate you tuning in this is misha and we will catch you next time